We had an absolute classic in the Premier League this weekend. Newcastle hosting West Ham at St James's Park was going to always be a massive six-pointer for those European spots on the table. We previewed the match, we did a score prediction for it, and in the video today I've got my analysis of the game, where it was won and lost for Newcastle and West Ham respectively, and I've tried to record this kind of live as the game was happening, so any thoughts, feedback, or anything else in between, please do drop it in the comment section. At any point in the video, if you do laugh, you learn, you like something or whatever, please do like and subscribe for more content like this and yeah let's just get stuck straight into it so the team sheets are out there's not too many surprises we do see Livermento get the start for Newcastle with Jamal Lascelles pick up the captain's armband in the absence of Sven Botman and unfortunately Miguel Almiron isn't quite fit enough to get the start here when we look at the West Ham team probably the big surprise in the starting 11 for me is James Ward-Prowse coming in for the beginning we had suspected Calvin Phillips may have got the start here to try and be extra defensive extra resolute for West Ham because as we know with West Ham fans and David Moyes it's just, the style of play is definitely not to their liking. We know the style of play we're going to get out of this Newcastle team. No two ways about it. But it's all going to be about the midfield battle between Pac-Man, Lucas Paqueta and Bruno Guimaraes, former Leon teammates, current national team teammates, of course, as well. Both are the main men in the team here. But the midfield supporting act here of Joe Willock and Longstaff probably doesn't give you as much confidence in the Newcastle midfield as when you see the likes of Suchek and James Ward-Prowse in here to support Lucas Paqueta. And for that reason, I do suspect Newcastle are going to try and avoid the central area of the pitch as often as possible. Try and use the likes of Livermento. I know you don't want Byrne going too high up the pitch, but certainly Gordon and Isak will want to be running into space from wide areas. And Murphy has been, you know, relatively threatening recently. And Willock is always quite handy to pop out into these spaces for a two-on-one, play a ball into the channel, a late run into the box on the counter-attack, that kind of thing. Whereas with West Ham, you can see them being nice and deep and compact here with this starting 11, and very clearly, they want to play long balls into the channel for Caduce to be left one-on-one -on -one with Lascelles, or even with Bowen, if he can get into this pocket here, in between the likes of Burn and Shar, because that is a front three on the counter-attack. Newcastle will really struggle to recover the full ground against them if they get the space to run into. And if Newcastle do try and go further up the pitch, this is something that will be very interesting to see how they compensate, how they deal with it. I think the first half is probably going to start off with a good tempo with both of these starting 11s. Both of them really do want the same route to go. Newcastle are looking for Kufal. They're looking for Emerson. These guys to really give West Ham their width. And again, the likes of Murphy, Isak, Gordon, they're going to be looking at the run into these spaces. But I do think as far as a Premier League match goes, this might be a rather vacant central midfield just with Newcastle maybe not wanting to get into man for man duels on a regular basis across the game and quite frankly West Ham will probably not shirk going through the middle but with Kufal and Emerson Kudus and Bowen you do feel that they are always going to be looking for those wide areas here in Paqueta just try and give him that space to float into pockets to try and collect the ball maybe that's a kind of similar thing with Bruno but we know with Bruno in Newcastle he's normally a little bit deeper and a little bit more conservative and it's more long range passing that we're going to see from him. Byrne has been called into question quite a lot for Newcastle so this will be a big test for him against Bowen. This is the sort of opponent that Byrne, Shar, these kind of guys they need to be resolute against. Newcastle have got 12 losses on the table already. They cannot afford to lose this game if they're going to get into the European spots. And also Livermento being the big money heir to the Trippier throwing, or cover left back, whatever, against someone like Caduce, against Antonio, who will probably look to double up in these areas here with Emerson in support. It's going to be a huge ask, a huge task for Livermento. And again, I think we'll probably see where some of these Newcastle players are at, where the management team's at, can they get the result in a do or die fixture like this is for the European spots in the league table. The first half of that game is absolutely bonkers and totally delivers on, I think, all expectations coming into the match. And to be honest with you, I don't really know if the statistics actually do this game justice. It's been end-to-end, -end, but it's been quite ferocious and quite chaotic all at once. Newcastle started the first half really, really well, and West Ham reverted to that, you know, keep it tight in the first 10 minutes, don't do anything stupid, don't give anything away, and really, you know, giving Newcastle home possession right from the off from the beginning of the game. Newcastle find themselves banking West Ham into their box, they buy the penalty, of course, lovely, uh, you know, play from Gordon to get in front of the man to win the penalty. Isak converts, and confidence is high in the stadium, confidence is high in Newcastle. And Newcastle are doing pretty well at having some nice build-up play, but like I thought before kickoff, they are really avoiding playing through the middle, unless it's to Bruno in a little bit of space. Otherwise, we're looking at Longstaff, to, or, or Bruno himself, playing balls out to Murphy, or if that's not on, trying to go to Gordon. Gordon's definitely been the number one guy for Newcastle to go to out on that left-hand side as the, the first half has progressed. But when West Ham turned the ball over, they're very, very good at finding James Ward-Prowse 
who's very good at finding Lucas Paqueta, or, you know, they're very good at finding Lucas Paqueta himself, and he in the middle has got so much space. It's like I said before the game even kicked off. Man for man, West Ham are really strong in this central midfield, and Willock has done okay in attack. For me, Longstaff just doesn't offer this Newcastle midfield anything, so it does feel that there's a real, you know, Bruno's got a big job on his hands there, going man for man against Paqueta, trying to control the game, trying to win the ball from one another, and trying to create goal-scoring opportunities. We then have Lascelles going off injured, and a total back four reshuffle for Newcastle, and as I was kind of setting this up as the, as the game was progressing, you can see it right there, the writing's on the wall, where the goal actually comes from, you know, Paqueta picks the ball up in a central area of the pitch, where the ball's kind of turning over in possession, he's got that awareness, he's got that vision, he plays Antonio through the middle of the defence, he finds himself one-on-one -on -one with Dubravka and, you know, puts the hammers one each back level. And after that defensive reshuffle, you really did feel that a bit of that, oh, all the confidence Newcastle had from leading the game was really sucked out of the pitch and really maybe out of the stadium, obviously I'm not there, I'm, I'm sitting here watching it with you guys. And West Ham really then started to strut their stuff and there's a lovely rotation pattern going in here where Lucas Paqueta is of course the main man, the main creator, but Thomas Suchek is nice and deep, kind of shielding that defence so you can try and use Emerson and Kufal a bit higher and wider when the opportunity presents itself. And James Ward-Prowse is just in this orbit of the centre area of the pitch, never really gets too high and he maybe will come back and really support the defence in two deep banks of four. But Mohamed Kudus is a wide threat. Coming in centrally has been the biggest form in Newcastle's side. And as much as when Bruno's been picking up the ball, he's always looking for Gordon out on the left. When Paqueta's picking up the ball, he's always looking for Bowen on that left or inside left run. And it is a battle of the left-hand side. So since Livramento's been on to the left-hand side, he's had a bit, a bit more experience, a few more reps for Newcastle on that left-hand side. Him, Willock and Gordon have been linking up pretty well off the back of Bruno gaining possession of the ball. You know, sometimes it's on for the likes of Longstaff or Murphy, but ultimately it's about getting to Isak really quickly. You know, Bruno play, can play the ball out to Murphy and Murphy can just swing across very quickly to the striker or they're going to go out left and try and play some football and create some space that way. And when Bruno played that ball out there for Murphy to cross it to Isak, it initiated this lovely little sequence of Bruno doing something and then Paqueta doing the exact same thing, where he then picks the ball up from that clearance and plays it out for Kudus, who makes a really good play himself, getting to the byline and finding basically no one with the cross. So two kind of half chances created from the midfielders playing long diagonals within quick succession was fun to see. And right as we get to half time, West Ham take the advantage. They take a free kick very quickly, down the line for Bowen, who cuts it back, and Caduce finishes promptly. And like I was kind of alluding to there, I know a lot of the headlines are going to be around Paqueta versus Bruno, because that is very much the engine room of the game and where everything's coming from. But this really is a little bit of Gordon versus Caduce in terms of, you know, who is going to do the best here. Both defences are kind of chaotic and all over the place, but West Ham feel way more composed about it, accepting and comfortable, and they have a kind of plan to deal with everything in that kind of mess. Whereas with Newcastle, I guess the substitution and the injury really does put the microscope on it, but it really does feel that they are uncomfortable in this situation at the moment. At halftime, there is so much pressure on Eddie Howe to deliver the war cry, the battle cry, to organise the troops as well and get themselves back into this game because losing to West Ham in this match would mean a 13th Premier League loss of the season, which for me means European football is off the cards. I'm expecting a big, big second half from Newcastle. David Moyes and Coba, they're going to be in there getting the battle plan ready for the second half. They're in control. They're winning the game. They've got everything to gain now by being anti-football camping and not making any mistakes. So we might see a bit of that, which does stifle Newcastle a little bit because they want to keep playing the ball into space. So the second half is going to be a real case of the bench, individual players' nerve, and maybe a little bit of the refereeing because there's been some contentious, you know, with the quick free kick for the goal, like, I don't, it is a goal for me, like, I don't think it's a head injury, get a wee slap in the face, you know, it's football, you know, it's not a head injury, his nose wasn't bleeding or, you know, anything like that, so, you know, through the second half, you feel the temperature's going to rise, we've had over two and a half goals in the first half, which is a huge indicator that fireworks is going to take, take off. My score prediction for this game was two each, and with West Ham leading 2-1 at half time, by the way, I feel a wee bit more confident that that might come in. I could see Newcastle, look, Willock has been effective in attack, I do feel that Newcastle have a bit more firepower, but the individual brilliance of Paqueta and Kudus is really what's going on here uh, for West Ham, and the rest of the team is really around organising and letting that happen, whereas with Newcastle, because of a mountain of reasons, 
don't really feel as composed and as organised. So it's hard to imagine Newcastle going on to get the victory at this stage, but you never know how the second half is going to unfold. Sliding doors effects of injuries, substitutions, goals, VAR decisions, penalties. I'm sure it could all happen. What a roller coaster that second half was. Honestly, I don't even know where to begin. The first half, the statistics we were saying did not reflect the game at all. It was very much more end to end and no one really seemed to have control of the game. In the second half, you could definitely describe it as being that way. But especially for the last 15, 20 minutes of the game, Newcastle just had West Ham's number. West Ham were just banked into their own box, couldn't get out their own half. And ultimately, as we know, Newcastle managed to get a famous turnaround in this game here. And right from the second half, Newcastle should have had a bit of a reason to be a bit more confident coming into the second half with Ariola being subbed off for Lucas Fabianski. But it didn't take long for Mohamed Kudus to play through Jared Bowen for a bit of a sucker punch in the 48th minute to give West Ham what felt like an unassailable 3-1 lead. And like I said at halftime, Newcastle hadn't showed anything in this game to suggest they were going to get the amount of chances, create the amount of shots on target to get the amount of goals to turn it really around for a victory at 2-1. So at 3-1, it felt like really a, a mountain too big to climb. And from there, it just felt like it was going from bad to worse because Newcastle are forced into a triple change which sees Almiron coming on for Livramento, Anderson for Willock and Hong on for Kraft. And again, another full reshuffle at the back with trying to keep the legs fresh everywhere else in the pitch. But with the introduction of Almiron, this is the first time Newcastle have got genuine high quality threat in their full front three here. Murphy's done okay in this game with some of the crosses he's delivered, but Almiron, Gordon and Isak was way more of a threat and you felt like yeah Newcastle might be able to get a goal and if they get the goal quick enough they might be able to put the pressure on West Ham to get that draw. That only lasts 10 minutes before Almiron needs to be subbed off and Harvey Barnes is brought on and with a wee bit of a reshuffle in the front line Gordon moving over to the right he did seem to feel his hamstring and pull up ever so slightly but again Newcastle maintaining a really strong front three with Barnes just off the treatment table and like I say uh, Gordon maybe being a wee bit iffy in this game there's way more pressure on the likes of Longstaff and Anderson being encouraged to go forward and with West Ham bringing on Calvin Phillips who then very quickly gets himself into hot water causing the foul on Anthony Gordon for the penalty but for me this is not a penalty this is actually one of my biggest pet peeves in professional football if I'm going to go and clear the ball I'm taking a shot I'm making a pass and you're going to be brave enough or stupid enough to try and intercept me getting the ball to win a tackle get the ball for yourself or whatever, then that's on you. If I'm going to go and absolutely leather the ball, it really annoys me more when it's like strikers that are taking a shot rather than like Calvin Phillips here who's making a clearance. But all the same, if I'm mid-action, you know, you see his body shape, he's going to absolutely leather it, empty the box and clear it. He's only got eyes for the ball. It's, for me, it's not a penalty, it's not a foul. But hey, VAR steps in and I think the pressure on the referee is then to give it. And I think West Ham should feel really aggrieved at this get out of jail free card that West uh, that Newcastle got in terms of the penalty. But, you know, Newcastle have definitely got some karma points in the bank to maybe be cashing in in a situation like this. But from that point onwards, this game deteriorated more and more. Initially, it was on the Newcastle end, but as the game went on, West Ham were guilty of this as well, of it being... 22 footballers running around the pitch trying to work out who's going to win it or who's going to get the shots away. And West Ham, for a large spell this second half, definitely still felt like they were in control strategically, tactically in the game and all the rest of it. And Newcastle were just trying to find like Gordon from Bruno and they were limited in options. But actually, as the game went on, it looked like West Ham lost ideas, lost their identity. And Newcastle just got more legs onto the pitch. Anderson, honestly, I don't know. Longstaff missed an absolute sitter. I said that at halftime, but I really don't see how he stayed on the pitch ahead of Willett. But Anderson, great legs. Hall was a good contribution on the left-hand side here. And like I say, Murphy was pretty decent with those artillery crosses. None of them really came off, but it definitely gave West Ham something to think about. But when Alexander Isak drops into that pocket and plays a pass through for Harvey Barnes to get the free each equaliser, I was saying straight away, this is why you get by a guy like this. I've been a big critic of this transfer just because of, you know, he should be a second string attacker. It was a huge amount of money and he has been injured for a huge part of the season. And when you see how thin the Newcastle squad is, it just feels like a bad appropriation of funds or capital. But when he gets that equaliser, it's going to be a huge point in the race for the European spots for Newcastle. Like I've said, they cannot afford a loss in this game. He gets them back on level terms and it's, you know, all singing, all dancing for Newcastle. And from there, it doesn't take long before Anthony Gordon is playing the ball through for him to get the absolute screamer of a winner right at the death and I think there was probably like 120 minutes played in this match it did really feel like a cup final and see for anyone that wasn't watching the league table or has been paying attention to either club 
in any great detail this season. It was maybe a bit of a surprise that this was a real blood and thunder affair, but for both teams, this was a huge match, a massive six-pointer. You've seen the typical David Moyes, Moisaya kind of stuff coming out here where it was, they were in 3-1. They then went to go defensive and trying to hold on to the win, and then it was at least hold on to the draw bringing on Ben Johnson, Danny Ings for Kufal, maybe try and get herself back to the draw after being in a losing position. And they should feel really robbed after this game because I say that penalty decision, the second penalty for me is uh, it's criminal, to be honest with you. But a massive three points for Newcastle. And do you know, I felt so bad for Eddie Howe. A lot, I was putting a lot of pressure on him at half time. He had to get a result out of this game. He had to rally the troops at half time. And with the injuries that happened, he has real no control over the, the negatives that happen in this game. And that has been a real microcosm of the entire season. And I really felt terrible that this game was going to shake out like that. And I'm so glad that, you know, between him and Jason Tindall, they made fantastic decisions, not just with their substitutions, but they had to think quick on their feet. They had to really put square pegs into round holes and still be positive and still give the team encouragement to go on and try and get something out of the game and to go the full distance and get a win. This is a massive W for Eddie Howe and the team there. I think Harvey Barnes has done a season-defining contribution here, which for a guy that costs in excess of 20, 30 million quid, whatever it was, is what you're after at the beginning of the season. And I know he's not, and although he's not featured that often you know this is a great sign of hopefully what's to come for him Anthony Gordon getting sent off at the end he's going to miss the midweek match as well as some of the other guys who maybe hobbled off today so Newcastle are maybe going to go into the next game really on the stretcher and you know previously in the season I've seen Newcastle go into these situations and totally rip them off and they've come out with some fantastic results so I look forward to seeing how they shape up and how they prepare for the midweek but for West Ham they are only one point ahead of Newcastle Newcastle do have that game in hand as well and with that game in hand by the way they're getting very close to Man United again and if Newcastle can imagine getting into 6th and 7th position then this season can be considered for me a success but for West Ham it goes from good to bad their fixture list is only going to get worse over the next month at home at all Tottenham away to Wolves and then they've got two legs against Bayern Leverkusen sandwiched around a game with Fulham and then when they came out the other side of that Europa League you know probably elimination I'm going to say Leverkusen are on it at the moment they then return to play Palace Liverpool and Chelsea in quick succession Luton and Man City thereafter so it does feel for me that this is a three points this is maybe a, like I mentioned at the beginning a six pointer for those European positions because West Ham are going to find it even tougher for points to come by in this next kind of month or so I really hope we see this as the beginning of a massive win streak for Newcastle that can see them secure that sixth or seventh position because quite frankly I think they're, they're earning it you know they're just about there they've had some real bad luck with some results and with injuries in general like today honestly was you know, the worst extent of it, the nth degree of how bad it's been, but it really does show how the whole season has been transpiring. And I'd love to see them overcome that obstacle, be able to reinforce in the summer and then be a real credible threat on the Premier League like across the whole season. I hope you enjoyed this video, my kind of summary, my review, my analysis of the game. Tried it in a little bit of a different format this time. Uh, if you did enjoy this, please do like and subscribe. On screen there now some other stuff that I've made that YouTube thinks you might enjoy. Stay out of trouble and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.